Hi, my name is Jeff Petraka, and I'm an educator and entomologist here at the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Today, we're going to be doing one of my absolute favorite labs. We're going to learn how to detect the presence of genetic modification in various different snack food products by a technique known as PCR. Now, when we're talking about genetic modification in consumer products, very often we are concerning ourselves with plant material, genetically modified plant material. And so this lab is particularly close to my heart because I study insects and plants and insects pretty much go hand in hand, right? So I find the concepts in this lab particularly interesting. And so when you hear the phrase genetically modified organisms, I think it tends to have a negative connotation in today's society. There's a lot of uh, negative press surrounding genetic modification and the health consequences of genetically modified organisms and uh, all these various different things. And, you know, to be clear right from the outset, there's nothing inherently bad about genetic modification per se. Um, there are pros and cons to genetically modified organisms, or I should say their use in consumer products. And we're going to talk about those throughout this lab uh, throughout both this first part here today and the following second part of this uh, procedure. And so I want you to go through this lab kind of with, an, with sort of a, a clear mind. Don't think in terms of uh, GMOs are bad or good. I just want you to look at this from an impartial perspective and learn about how we can actually detect them in various different snack foods. And so, as I mentioned, this is a particularly long lab. So the first part here today, we are simply going to be learning how to extract DNA from various different snack food products. And in particular, uh, we're going to extract DNA from this cheesy corn chip right here and a, an organic corn chip over here. We're also going to extract DNA from some controls, like all good experiments. Our experiment here needs a control. In fact, two controls to be precise. And we are going to use um, genetically modified corn, or I should say known, a known sample of genetically modified corn. So uh, basically the, in this little tube here, there's a little uh, piece of a leaf of um, what is known to be a genetic modified corn plant. And I also have some wild type corn over here. So these are going to serve as our positive and negative control. So positive control because it does have genetic modification uh, uh, within this sample here, and negative because it does not have any genetic modification. Modification. So uh, to carry out this lab, after we isolate and extract DNA from our controls and food products, we're going to amplify particular regions of their genome. And so genome being, of course, the totality of this organism's uh, DNA. Uh, we're going to amplify some specific regions of their DNA in order to actually detect whether or not there's genetic modification present in each one of these snack foods. And so uh, before we get started, though, I think it's pretty important to understand a little bit about the background and theory behind what we're doing here in order to have a better understanding of uh, each of the steps that we carry out in the lab. So let's take a look at that first. So before we start talking about the procedure in today's lab, I think it's important to review the basic structure of DNA. So if you look up on the board here, you'll notice that we have an artist's rendering of, um, a, of what, are, what are supposed to be DNA molecules. And you'll notice that these molecules resemble ladders that are like twisted around. And we call that a double helical structure, or specifically an alpha helical structure. And so DNA is a, is a type of nucleic acid, and it's composed of two strands of nucleic acids that are associated with one another. Now, the building blocks of these nucleic acids are known as nucleotides. And nucleotides have some specific components as well. They have three uh, specific components to be precise. So the first of which being a sugar, and in DNA, we're talking about deoxyribose, that's in the name DNA, of course. Then we have a phosphate, and we also have a nitrogenous base. Now, if you look at the basic structure over here, the sugar and phosphate are bound together, and they are, they are what consists of these uh, long chains running on either side of the molecule here. And so we call that the backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. Those sugars and phosphates are connected to one another by covalent bonds, very strong chemical bonds. And specifically, they're called phosphodiester bonds. 
Now in the middle, there are these little structures spanning the length of those uh, sugar phosphate backbones. And those are the nitrogenous bases. Notice that there are uh, basically two of these bases spanning the length of um, the, the two sugar phosphate backbones. And so in DNA, we have four different nitrogenous bases. So we have A, or adenine, T for thymine, C for cytosine, and G for uh, guanine. And so these guys are the nitrogenous bases. And they always associate with specific complementary bases. So A always goes with T. Uh, a, T obviously goes with A, C goes with G, and of course G goes with C. So they bond in a complementary fashion with one another. And not just any type of bond as well, it's actually a hydrogen bond. So these bases are uh, essentially united by hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonds are relatively strong when you're talking about intermolecular forces, but they're actually relatively weak when you compare it to those covalent bonds in the sugar phosphate backbone. This is pretty important because what it allows um, for is for the two strands of, uh, of, uh, of DNA to essentially separate apart and recombine given sufficient energy, but it does not decompose that sugar phosphate backbone. And the reason that that's so important is because the specific sequence of these bases in DNA code for protein. And so if you are familiar with this process, essentially uh, DNA contains what are known as genes. So all organisms have DNA, all living things have DNA. And when we encounter one of these specific sequences of nucleotides that code for protein, we call it a gene. So that's a very specific thing. And basically an organism's genome is not made up of entirely just genes. There's a lot of other stuff going on as we'll talk about momentarily, but just remember that a protein coding element is a gene. And so that gene can be transcribed. And transcription is the process whereby um, DNA is turned into a complementary sequence of RNA. That RNA will then carry the message of the DNA from the nucleus or from wherever that, that uh, DNA might be located to the ribosomes where it can then be translated into protein. So we go to the ribosomes um, for translation. And so that process of translation essentially involves taking that sequence of RNA and converting it into a sequence of amino acids, which will then uh, fold onto, it, onto it themselves and turn into a protein, a functional protein. And that's where um, why the sequence of these DNA nucleotides ultimately are so important. And like I said, the gene itself, this uh, RNA coding sequence, is not the only thing that's contained within an organism's genome. And there's a lot of other stuff in a genome. So for example, in the human genome of the 3.2 billion base pairs that make up our genome, less than about 2% of that is actually protein coding elements. The rest of it is all other stuff. And specifically, uh, there's a lot of regulatory sequence, for instance. And regulatory sequence is basically sequence that signals the start and stop of processes like transcription uh, or even replication or something of that sort. And so if you look up on this um, sort of image of a, of a protein coding, coding gene here on the board, you'll notice that it highlights these two regions at the beginning and at the end of the protein coding element, known as a promoter and a terminator. Now, if you notice, these colors on the board here are green for the promoter and red for the terminator. And that's actually very um, important because what a promoter does is it's essentially a sequence of nucleotides that initiates or signals to RNA polymerase to start transcription. The terminator, on the other hand, is, the, uh, is a sequence that will signify the stop of transcription. And that's why we have the green and red colors, so corresponding to stop, to start and go, respectively, kind of like a traffic light. 
And these are pretty important. We're going to come back to specifically promoters in a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, how we're going to use those, or I should say how scientists or researchers might use those in a genetically modified cell. So what exactly is a genetically modified organism? So the definition of genetic modification is pretty simple. Basically, organisms that have had their DNA changed through some type of genetic engineering. Sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? But you know, this, just to be clear, is not something um, like selective breeding, for instance. So selective breeding, of course, being like if you took a uh, really big, pretty rose and you found it in a population growing and you took that plant and you got pollen from that rose and you crossbred it with other uh, roses and you were trying to select for a population of, of roses that all had gigantic flowers. So it's, that's selective breeding. That's a little bit different. That's not really genetic modification in the sense that we're talking about today. Genetic modification is literally, um, literally picking up uh, uh, DNA from one organism and inserting it into another or going into the DNA of one organism and canceling out a gene or incorporating another gene, et cetera. And so when we talk about picking up DNA from one organism and putting it into another, there are multiple ways that we could do this. So for plants, for instance, one of the most common uh, techniques is by the use of this so-called gene gun, which is literally a device that is used to, with force and pressure, inject a piece of DNA into plant cells and plant tissue. And so this is a, um, a pretty big apparatus over here on the left, but uh, over here we have a little handheld version. And these are pretty expensive, believe it or not. They're like tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, they're, they're not cheap at all. <laughs> um, but for mammals or other animals, uh, you might want to do something like DNA micro-injection. So that literally involves taking a sample of modified DNA and incorporating it into a host, into a, uh, a very young cell and probably like a zygote or something, one of the first cells that would form um, after the fertilization of gametes because uh, you want to make sure that every cell in the animal's body or mammal's body has um, that particular genetic component that you incorporate. Alternatively, you might use a technique like transformation or viral transduction. And so uh, what we mean by those is transformation being essentially building a recombinant piece of DNA like this recombinant plasmid here. And a plasmid is just a very small ring of DNA. This is very, very tiny. So we're talking about something that is, you know, maybe just a few hundred base pairs in size. It's not a very large piece of DNA, but that can be easily taken up by a bacterium. So we have a bacterial cell over here, for instance, with its little genome in the middle. And uh, this would involve essentially taking this little plasmid and incorporating it into a bacterial cell or some other type of cell. And that plasmid, of course, would contain your gene of interest. So that might, uh, you might actually incorporate that gene like over here, let's say, in the plasmid. Viral transduction works very similarly, except we use viruses. And basically down here in the image, we have a, an artist's rendering of a bacteriophage, for instance. And that bacteriophage has uh, DNA inside. And we can essentially build a virus that has that DNA. And we can let the virus do the work for us. And it will go to cells and incorporate this uh, new um, recombinant piece of DNA that contains a particular gene of interest that we want to incorporate into a host organism. And so when we talk about genetic modification, we have to ask why are we even doing this in the first place? What's the benefit of this? And I want to take a little step back for a second and talk about history. And so um, in the early 50s and 60s, we have this period in the agricultural industry known as the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution involved was this desire to meet the growing demands of food through the use of various different types of technology, including things like pesticides to kill unwanted insects and uh, other uh, plants like weeds, for instance, and a, a, something that's a weed killer is known as a herbicide. Um, there are various different irrigation procedures that were, that were uh, instituted. There are uh, fertilizers, me mechanical equipment like this gigantic harvester over here in the image, um, big sprayers that would uh, spray crops 
with uh, pesticides. And basically, all of this drive was to reduce costs of labor, uh, reduce the damage to crops from insects or other weeds, and so on and so on. But there are some inherent problems with pesticides, herbicides, and things of that sort. And even honestly with um, these gigantic machines, I mean, these machines cost money, they break down, they need to be serviced, they need to be worked on. And, you know, with pesticides and herbicides, I mean, I think it's you know, in today's world, I think it's pretty clear uh, <laughs> some of the issues associated with them. You know, sometimes pesticides are, they're great. They can kill a, a, pot a potential insect pest on your crop, but they might seep into uh, uh, water sources. They might affect non-target organisms causing um, ecological uh, effects that we, do, that we do not want. And honestly, they're costly in themselves as well. And so after that, there's the second green revolution. And so we're sort of in the midst of that still to this day. And it's essentially the push to develop genetic technology that can help farmers and industry build crops that have all of those components, all of those factors that we want in our crop to increase the yield of that crop and to reduce pest uh, destruction and the effects of pests on our crops. And so basically, if you were to uh, sort of assay and take a look at all of these various different plants throughout the world, um, there are plants out there and there are other organisms that contain genes, protein coding elements that can help us deal with some of those issues. And in particular, for instance, if we were to look at insect resistance, let's say that we had a, we knew that a, a bacterial cell produced a toxin that was really, really good at killing caterpillars. And let's say that toxin was a protein, and therefore that, because that, that uh, it's a protein, the, in, the building instructions for building that protein would be contained within that bacterial genome. So if we could go into that bacterial genome, pull out that gene for that toxin and then incorporate it into our plants, then wouldn't those plants build that toxin for us? Yeah, right? That's a pretty nifty way of dealing with a pest issue and a crop. And the same could be said for things like uh, herbicides as well. So uh, herbicide resistance, you might ask yourself, why would we want, even want to do that? Why would we even want to incorporate a herbicide resistant uh, gene into our crops? And well, when you think about it, you know, if, you've ever, if you have a garden at home, weeds grow in your garden, those weeds occupy habitat or space that plants that you want in your garden cannot use because those weeds are there. Those weeds will sap nutrients and water from the soil and they can ultimately kill your plants. And so farmers and uh, industrial um, agricultural firms have that same issue. So they need, it would be behoove them if they had a way to spray herbicides on their crops without actually killing the plants that they want, but just targeting weeds and things that are growing amongst uh, their crop. And so that's one particular application. But there are also environmental factors that we have to be concerned with. And in, and in terms of uh, a couple examples, there's this concept of drought tolerance and frost tolerance. And so there are plants out there that are really good at dealing with changing climate. And, you know, in today's day and age, what with our changing climate and these wacky temperatures that we experience um, seasonally, it is a really good idea to have sort of fail safes built into your crops that um, wherein, you know, if you took a gene from a plant that was able to deal with something like a frost, for instance, uh, if you were to take that gene and incorporate it into your corn crop, your corn crop is going to be much more um, likely to deal with a, a wacky, weird weather event um, in your farm. And so the, this concept of genetically modified crops has grown and grown and grown. And, you know, when you talk, when, in terms of the, the um, amount of farmland worldwide, you know, there are, you know the po human population is growing and growing and growing. And genetic modification can help to uh, bring crops and plants that, couldn't, that could not have grown in certain environments to all corners of the, of the globe, essentially by incorporating genes that could help crops grow in an, under environmental circumstances that they're not used to dealing with. And um, 
in, as of 2015, over 440 million acres of farmland worldwide contain these genetically modified crops. And um, if you were to take a look at a graphic, and I believe this comes from uh, the USDA, we can see that in recent years, the prevalence of genetically modified crops has increased. So uh, if you look from 1996 down here, it's relatively low compared to here. Now, like these are some major crops like soybean and um, cotton and corn. And you can see how the levels or the percentages of crops that contain genetically modified uh, organisms have seriously increased. Um, and this is just as of 2017. So I wanted to go back to that example of the bacterial toxin that affects caterpillars, because that's actually a, a thing. And uh, I was talking about the BT toxin. And the BT toxin comes from the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium. It's these little white guys down here in the image. And the toxin that they produce is a protein that when ingested by lepidopteran larvae, and specifically butterflies and moths, although it does affect other insect larvae as well, it causes those larvae to invert, essentially like destroys their gut and they, they poop it out, <laughs> more or less. Um, I say this because I've actually had caterpillar livestock. I've been, I raised caterpillars my, my entire life and this toxin has had its effect on uh, many of my caterpillars over the years. Uh, it's a really nasty thing, but you know, theoretically, if you're a farmer growing corn, let's say, and you wanted to uh, essentially figure out a way to influence those uh, Lepidopter and butterfly and moth pests on your crops without applying costly environmentally um, uh, uh, and, and financially insecticides, um, you could essentially incorporate this gene for BT into your corn plant. And if you do that, then theoretically, this BT toxin is going to be expressed throughout all of the leaves in your corn plant. So whenever a caterpillar like this European corn borer over here finds its way to your corn crop, it will ingest the leaves of the plant and inadvertently ingest the toxin, causing that caterpillar to die. And that's the idea. So the whole goal of this is to reduce the necessity for the application of insecticides and also increase crop yield. So it's actually a very positive goal. Now, the downside to this is that there might be other effects on the environment that we're not really realizing. And so what wound up happening when this was first implemented um, was that the corn plant, the BT corn plants, wound up producing pollen. And that pollen went and was carried off by the wind and wound up traveling out into the environment. And it wound up landing on milkweed plants in the adjacent fields to these corn, these, these GM corn um, uh, crops. And monarch butterfly caterpillars were feeding on those milkweed leaves and they wound up inadvertently ingesting the toxin and dying. So this is what, something we would call a non-target effect. And of course, I don't think this was an intended goal, of course, but it wound up happening anyway. And that's not a good thing. And so that's one of the dangers of the applications of these uh, GM uh, organisms. And We'll talk more about the pros and cons of GMOs in part two of our video, but for today, I wanted to get a jump on the DNA extraction and uh, amplification of, uh, our, of, the, of these specific gene regions in our snack food products. And so uh, if you could put a purpose on today's lab, and it's good, I, I do this, I, I wanted to write this purpose down just because uh, if you're a student and you're watching this and you're following along, sometimes with some of our more complicated labs, it's hard to uh, follow exactly what we're doing. And I want you to keep this purpose in the back of your mind. In fact, you should even write it down as you watch this video, just so that you know and remind yourself exactly what we're doing. So we are trying to determine if these various snack foods, specifically a cheesy corn chip and an organic corn chip, uh, contain evidence of genetic modification. That's all that we are doing here today. Okay, and remember we have those positive and negative controls as well. So how are we gonna actually figure out if our, our snack foods have genetic modification? And so we were talking earlier about this concept of promoters. Now promoters, as a reminder, signal the start of transcription. Now if you're a genetic engineer, 
you know, your, your goal is to incorporate a gene that codes for a protein that you want expressed in that organism. And so a common way that a genetic engineer might ensure the transcription of their uh, particular incorporated gene is with a special, highly efficient promoter known as the 35S promoter that originally was isolated from the cauliflower mosaic virus. So it's a very, very efficient tr promoter. And so the idea for this is if you put this 35S promoter, so here we have a piece of DNA, here we have our gene of interest over here. So I'm gonna color that in red. Okay, let's say that's the BT gene, for instance. Um, this 35S promoter, we're gonna put that right in front of the BT gene or whatever our gene of interest is, because what that essentially does is it guarantees or at least makes it much more likely that our gene of interest is gonna be expressed in our host cell. So, you know, think about it. You know, just because you incorporate a, a gene of interest into a host doesn't necessarily mean that those cells are gonna express that gene. So that's, what this third, that's where this 35S comes in. It turns out that a pretty high percentage of uh, genetic, genetic modification in plant crops involve the use of this 35S promoter. In fact, sometimes it's not even just one promoter. Sometimes it's multiple promoters. So you might actually have two of these 35S um, promoters incorporated before your gene of interest or even more. You know, it depends on how much, uh, <laughs> how much promoting <laughs> you want going on. And so... The presence of this particular 35S component is not natural, right? So this will tell us if we can find it in a particular sample, that'll tell us that yes, some genetic modification has been going on. And specifically, uh, it'll tell us that some 35S modification has been going on. Now, we mentioned earlier this concept of positive and negative controls, right? Well, even Still, we want to have some other controls. We want to have a third control. And specifically, when we're talking about extracting DNA from snack foods, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, these corn chips that we're going to be extracting DNA from um, are very processed, right? So who's to say that the DNA is even still usable in there? How are we even going to, you know, who's to say that it's even going to be in good condition to be able to amplify anything? And so we have to be sure that whatever result we're getting from our extraction actually is plant DNA, and it's not just some artifact, some error. And so we're going to use a control region as another control. So this is like the third control. We have the positive, negative control, and then we also have this third control, which is tubulin. Now, tubulin is a ubiquitous protein. It's found in a lot of cells, a lot of plant cells. It should be found in every single plant cell. So the tubulin gene should be found in every single plant cell. It's good for, uh, by the way, it's involved in forming microtubules in plant cells. So you don't have to know that. What you have to know is that it should be found in every single plant cell, and it is a good control for our experiment here today. Okay, so in order to amplify our tubulin and 35S uh, gene regions, what we need to do first is extract DNA from our snack foods. Now, this is one of the hardest parts of this lab for students that come here and do this lab with us here because you have to get just the right size of uh, snack food product. If you get a piece that's too big, very often there's a lot of contaminants like fat and other things that will make it very difficult to isolate DNA from your food. Um, if you get a piece that's too small, there may not be enough DNA in the sample to amplify anything. So you need to get a size um, of a, a sa your sample uh, right around one to two millimeters. And so up on the board here, you can see this little tiny white dot here. That's the size that you're looking for. And here's a nickel for size reference. And so what I like to do is basically take my snack food and I will just use my fingernail to crack off a little tiny piece. I broke into a whole bunch of pieces. So here you go. I'm gonna show you exactly what I've got. So as you can see, it's not a lot. It's a very, very small piece. Again, you don't want too much. Um, you want just the right amount. And by the way, I'm just using my bare hands here because the gene regions that we're amplifying are plant specific. So I don't have to worry about contaminating with my own uh, DNA here. So I'm gonna put these in a little microfuge tube here and I've labeled the organic um, corn chip C. And so I'm just going to basically drop that little chunk of sample inside. 
Then I'm going to do the same thing for my cheesy corn chip as well. Now I've labeled, I put that in a yellow tube here, and I've labeled that the D. Okay, so there are my samples that I'm gonna be working with. The rest of these for now, I'm going to just leave off to the side here. We're not gonna be using the rest of that for the rest of the experiment. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to put these samples in a solution known as a lysis buffer. Lysis buffer, is means exactly what it sounds like. It's going to help to break up the snack food product as well as our positive and negative control plant tissue, and it's going to start breaking it up. And then what we're gonna do is place it over here in our heat bath, our incubator, at 65 degrees Celsius. That extra temperature is gonna to help to break up uh, some of that tissue and some of that processed food material in order to get at the DNA that is hiding within. And so I need to measure out specifically 300 microliters of, uh, of, our, of this lysis buffer. So I, it turns out I have the lysis buffer right over here. And um, again, that's going to help us to break up our samples. But I need to figure out a way of, of, of measuring that out and putting it into our, and mixing it with our samples. And so uh, I have these instruments here. These are called micropipettes. Micropipettes allow a biochemistry researcher to measure out specific volumes of liquids. And there are three different colors here, and you'll notice the different colors up on the top of the uh, buttons here on top of these micropipettes. The gray is the smallest. That measures anywhere between a half a microliter and 10 microliters. The yellow pipette here measures between 10 and 100 microliters, and the blue measures between 100 and 1,000 microliters. Since we're measuring 300 microliters of our lysis buffer, we're gonna use our blue pipette first. Now, I'm gonna briefly go through with you how to use a pipette. It's very simple. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because a lot of our other content on DNALC Live can show you how to uh, work with these a little more specifically. But basically, there's a space inside of this pipette, and there's a little knob here that will allow me to make that space either bigger or smaller as needed. That's going to change the volume inside of the pipette here. There are little numbers on the side of the pipette here, which you can kind of see in the, in the image here. Those numbers correspond to the amount of volume that's inside of the pipette. The button on top here, when I push it down to the first stop, um, and when I, mean, when I say first stop, I mean basically the, the first point that I encounter resistance, um, that will push out that exact volume that the pipette is set for. So then if I push to my first stop and I put this in a liquid and I let go, I take up that exact volume of liquid that I would expect. I can then take that liquid and then I can push it out into another tube or wherever and I would push my little button here all the way down. That actually pushes out a little bit more air than whatever the volume of the pipette is set for. And that just helps to get rid of all of that extra solution. A lot of our solutions in a chemistry or biochemistry lab are dissolved in water. And because water molecules like to stick to each other and the walls of the container that they find themselves in, that second stop will help to really kick out the rest of that residual leftover solution. Also, because we're working with multiple solutions here today, we want to make sure that we're not contaminating our samples by mixing them together. And so we have these little uh, tools here, these little devices known as pipette tips. And each one of the different colored pipettes has their own associated uh, color of tip. And they basically are just different sizes that fit the different pipettes. And so I'm going to set my blue pipette here for 0300, that's 300 microliters. Okay, when I'm at 0300 microliters, I'm going to then go ahead and press the blue pipette tip on. And uh, all I have to do is gently press it in and it's, it stays on just fine. Now I'm ready to go. I can actually measure out my uh, lysis buffer. So when I measure here, I go to my first stop, I go into the liquid, and then I let go with my thumb very, very slowly, taking up 300 microliters of lysis buffer. I'm going to put this 300 microliters into each one of my sample tubes. Now, I don't want to contaminate each of the samples by mixing them together. So what I'm gonna do is basically get rid of my pipette tips. And I have a, a, a little beaker up here that's gonna serve as like my fancy science waste for the day. And to get the tips off, I just basically push these little gray buttons on the, on the sides of the pipette here, and that'll eject the tip off. And then I can simply go ahead and get another tip. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my lysis buffer again, 300 microliters and I'm going to combine it with the cheesy corn chip sample and eject my tip. I'm gonna do the same thing for my positive and negative controls here. The positive control uh, is going to be in this little green tube here. 
and the negative control is going to be in this clear tube here, okay? So once I have my uh, samples combined with that 300 microliters of lysis buffer, the next thing to do is to help the process along. So yes, we're gonna put it in the, the heat bath, the incubator up here uh, for a little bit, but um, what we need to also do is give it a little bit of mechanical digestion going. And so I happen to have these little devices up here. These are uh, micro, or these are pestles rather. And these pestles will allow me to help digest some of the larger particulate in my samples here. Now, the corn chips here um, are going to break down pretty easily. And uh, this is another common area where students make mistakes or, or uh, essentially have issues when, we, when they come here to do the lab with us. And you have to really make sure that your sample is ground down very, very well. You know, and I, I will say that this is probably one of the hardest results, hardest labs that we offer here at the DNA Learning Center to get quality results out of, just because students will bring fruits and granola bars and all kinds of different products. And every product has its own unique uh, um, issues with dealing, trying to get DNA out of them. And so there are a lot of different ways to do DNA extraction. We're just doing the silica isolation method here, but you could do all other kinds of things. You could do, uh, there are quicker ways of doing this. You could uh, use liquid nitrogen to, to digest seeds and other things to break them down. So there are a lot of variations here. Um, we can even put them in this incubator here, the 65 degree incubator, and leave them sit overnight. But we're doing a little bit more of a quick and rapid silica technique here. Um, so just be aware that when you grind with the pestle here, you're going to put the pestle into the bottom here, and you're going to want to make sure that every single solid chunk, or at least as much as possible, is broken up as much as possible. So uh, we recommend that students spend between two and five minutes working on this grinding step here. And it's, you know, it sounds like, wow, how hard can it be? But it is, hard. <laughs> it's really annoying, trust me. Now, when I first started working here at the Learning Center, I was given a piece of advice that I always remember in the back of my mind. When you think you're done grinding the sample, um, just keep going a little bit more. <laughs> and it, it's true. Um, you really have to make sure that your samples are thoroughly broken up. Your goal is to get a nice cloudy solution in your sample. And what winds up happening often is that the sample will stick to the bottom of the tube like it is for me right now. And you want to flick it and just basically use the tip of the pestle to uh, lift up some of, that, uh, some of the larger chunks up against the side of the tube and gradually break them down. So there you go. We have a nice cloudy solution. Okay, there's still there's a little bit of solid down at the bottom, but that's okay. We're gonna put that into the heat bath. Now I've used the pestle on my organic corn chip here. I do not want to use the same pestle from multiple samples. So I'm gonna lay that off to the side and I'm going to grab a fresh pestle for the other samples. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing for each one of my samples here. Now I'm gonna spare you the thorough entertainment of watching me grind these samples up is not very interesting. Um, so I'll check back with you in just a few minutes. Okay, so I have ground up all of our samples, all four of our samples, the positive and negative control, as well as the cheesy and organic corn chip. And I'm just placing them right in here in the heat bath. And I'm gonna let them sit there for about 10 minutes or so. Um, now, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is prepare for the next step in the experiment. So um, we are right here where we have them sitting on the heat bath right now. And what we're going to need to do uh, when they come out of the heat bath is we're going to want to get rid of a lot of the big, solid chunks of material uh, that are left over in there that we couldn't that we couldn't grind up. And so uh, we're going to use a centrifuge to help us with that. And so right up here, I have a mini centrifuge. And these guys uh, basically have little holes inside. I press open here, and then there's like a little rotor in here that will allow for a micro centrifuge tube. That's those little tubes that we're working with. They're actually called microfuge tubes or micro centrifuge tubes for short, um, that'll allow those tubes to fit in here precisely. And uh, so we're gonna be using that. But what we need to do is we need to prepare for the, uh, uh, to separate away the liquids uh, that we're going to be pulling out of those tubes. Remember, we're trying to get rid of some of that chunky stuff that's gonna come out of the heat bath here. So what I'm gonna do is grab another four tubes, 
and I'm going to label them just to get them ready for our, uh, after our centrifugation. So uh, I'll check back with you in a few minutes while I let these samples sit in here and incubate for a little bit longer. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes or so. I'm gonna go ahead and pull my four tubes out of the incubator here. Okay, so they basically look the same. It doesn't look like much has really happened. If we left them sit overnight, it's possible that any solid chunks that are in here may have digested. In fact, the organic corn chip looked like uh, it digested quite a bit, uh, even in that short period of time. And so I'm gonna just leave them, actually I'm gonna put them right into the centrifuge. Remember, we're gonna spin these for uh, about a minute. Now, when I load up my tubes in the centrifuge, conventionally, it's important to put the tubes in the centrifuge so that the little hinge here is facing out. And I'm telling you that for a reason, because when we spin today, very often we're concerned with uh, what's going on in the solid stuff that falls on the bottom of the tube and the liquid that is up on top. Now there are, there are two names for that, for those two uh, locations in the tube. So all of the solid that concretes on the bottom, all of the heavy stuff, we're gonna call that our pellet. The liquid that's up on top is called the supernatant. And for this lab in particular, for the silica extraction method, we need to know the difference between those words. It's very important because very often in this lab protocol, we are going to throw away the pellet or throw away the supernatant, and we don't want to throw away the wrong thing at the wrong time. So you'll see what I mean momentarily, but ultimately our, our tubes, if you can imagine this being the tube here, there's gonna be a little liquid up on top. The pellet is going to be right below the hinge. So if we put the hinge facing outwards, like basically facing away from the center of the circle, the center of the centrifuge, we always know where to look for our pellet, right down here at the bottom. And sometimes it's gonna be smaller or larger depending on uh, the particular sample. So uh, that's why I say you should always spin with the uh, hinges facing out. The other thing that I did was I made sure that my centrifuge is balanced, meaning that I put one tube on one side of the centrifuge and another tube exactly opposite at that because if this instrument is unbalanced, the rotor on which this thing is spinning around might crack under the strain of an unbalance, of an imbalance, I should say, and might cause the centrifuge unit to implode or explode. So we don't want that. Um, so now, the goal of this centrifugation was to essentially uh, separate out a lot of those solid chunks and pull them down to the bottom. So right now, the stuff that we don't want is going to be right down here in the pellet. We do not want this stuff right now. What we want is this stuff up here because this, in the supernatant here, this is where our DNA is going to be. Okay, so we want the supernatant at this point. Okay, it's important that you remember those words. Um, so let's see what we're doing with that supernatant. So what we have to do is actually pull out 150 microliters of our supernatant and put it into a fresh tube. So uh, that's why I went ahead and labeled those tubes before the centrifugation step. So that's what those are being used for. Now, you'll notice that with this lab in particular, the pellets are a little wonky sometimes, especially the ones with the uh, positive and negative control. The plant material is all sort of floating all around. Um, and some of the snack foods will produce this big, sort of viscous looking pellet. And so here is the organic corn chip, for instance. Now, it's pretty blurry up on, on the screen here, but notice that right below the hinge, there's this pile of viscous material. That's your pellet. A lot of that is fat and nasty, gross stuff that we don't want. We just want that pure liquid up on top. It's that little tiny bit of liquid right up there. So it's going to be hard to get at this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a yellow pipette set for 75 microliters. And I'm going to basically carefully measure... 75 microliters twice in order to get a total of 150 microliters of fresh supernatant. The reason that I'm doing this is because uh, if with this particular step, it's better to get a pure supernatant and not uh, any of that pellet stuff on the bottom. So uh, I'm doing this carefully by doing it in two measurements of 75, 75 microliters because it'll be a little bit more accurate. Um, and so what I'm going to do is hold the tube up to my face like this so I can see that supernatant versus the pellet in my tube. I'm going to use my yellow pipette set for 75 microliters, and I'm going to carefully measure 75 microliters from the supernatant only, very, very slowly, so as to not dislodge that pellet. 
Then I'm going to go to my fresh tube that is labeled C for my organic corn chip. And I'm going to go to my second stop and deposit uh, that 75 microliters into that fresh tube. Then I'm going to use the same tip because it's the same solution. I'm going to go back in there and see if I can get another 75 microliters. And honestly, it does not look like I'm going to be able to do that. There's a lot of fat in this sample. And truthfully, I may have used a bigger sample than I would have liked. Um, I probably should have used a smaller sample. That would have avoided uh, some of that extra fat, but that's okay. Um, I didn't get quite 75 microliters on that one. I got maybe about half of that, but that's okay. Getting pure supernatant is better than getting 150 microliters, just to be clear. We want to avoid any of that nasty stuff on the bottom, that pellet. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same exact thing for the other samples. And by the way, when you're done, uh, that tube that we just put in the centrifuge, that's garbage. The rest of that is waste. We don't need that anymore. So I'm going to just throw that right, at, right at, into my uh, waste speaker here. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, and I'll see you in just a few moments. Okay, so there we go. All four of those tubes are done. So on to the next step. So now here comes the silica resin part. And I have a tube of silica right here. And silica resin is basically a little microscopic resin that will help us to reversibly bind a DNA. And you can see it in this tube here. It is basically floating back and forth. It looks like a milky white solution. Um, if silica has been sitting around for a long time, uh, there is a liquid in there as well. It will uh, evaporate off and you will be left with this hardened pellet of silica that's no good anymore. You want to make sure that you have a nice liquidy, milky solution of silica. Similarly, the silica will sort of settle itself out in the tubes. You always want to mix this up before using it. Now, this is a stock tube here. I'm not going to pull from that tube. It's good practice in a biochem lab to uh, take little aliquots, we call them, or little miniature solutions, partitions of a bigger stock tube, just in case I forget to change my tip or something. Um, and I don't contaminate a gigantic stock tube wasting all of the reagents. So right here, I have a little tiny aliquot of um, silica resin. And we don't need a lot. We only need about three microliters. So I'm going to use my gray pipette in order to measure that three microliters of silica resin into each one of my sample tubes. And so um, because we are going from one tube to the other, so here's my, my positive control here. Um, I'm going to be changing my tips every single time when I do this. So here's three microliters, by the way, of silica resin. That's easy to see because it's a solid solution. So you can see it right there in the tip of the pipette. I think you can anyway. Here. There you go. So it's a nice solid solution. So um, I'm going to inject that right in to the supernatant that I measured out. Then I'm going to get rid of my tip. The next thing I'm going to do is flick this and make sure that that silica resin goes all around the inside of the supernatant. Okay, so I want a nice cloudy solution at this point. I want to make sure that that silica resin basically goes all around the liquid that's inside of that tube. I'm going to do the same thing for each one of my other uh, samples. Now again, the silica resin is serving the purpose of reversibly binding DNA. What it does is it forms these little salt bridges with uh, DNA. And it can be broken down with the appropriate addition of reagents. And so basically all of the stuff uh, that we find in this, in this tube here, a lot, of their, a lot of it is not DNA still, right? We're trying to get rid of a lot of that other stuff. So what we're gonna do is essentially wash uh, our silica resin, but our silica resin right now is bound to DNA, or it's starting to bind to DNA. So it's gonna keep that DNA safe for us while we wash away the rest of the contaminants here. And so to help that reversible binding take place, we're going to throw our, our samples back into the heat bath uh, again for about five minutes this time. And this is okay to skip if you wind up or if you're in a rush or whatever, but I, I like to do it anyway just because the protocol recommends it. And this time, though, we're going to throw it in the heat bath set for 57 degrees Celsius. Now, it's actually still up here at about 63 degrees Celsius from the last uh, application, but that's okay. I'm going to put it in there anyway for now, and I'm going to give it about a five-minute break. So I'll see you in a few moments.
Okay, so it's been about five minutes sitting at 57 degrees Celsius over here. So our, uh, our silica resin hopefully has bound to whatever DNA is in this sample here. Uh, and so now what we wanna do is get rid of the rest of that junk. We wanna clean up our samples a little bit. And so basically to wash uh, our silica resin slash DNA. And what we're gonna do is remove some of the supernatant. And so we're gonna use our friend the centrifuge here again. And we're gonna spin for uh, 30 seconds Again, hinges facing out when we put these tubes in the centrifuge. We're making sure that the tubes are balanced with one another. All the same volume of liquid in there, essentially, so we're fine. I'm going to basically adjust the time. Oh, I'm adjusting the speed here. Hold on. <laughs> here we go. 30 seconds. And so now what we're going to do is we are basically going to start by removing the excess supernatant, a lot of that extra um, liquid that we don't want. And so uh, because there is 150 microliters of liquid in there, approximately, I'm going to go ahead and use um, my, I'm going to use my blue pipette this time, and I'm going to uh, use it to get rid of a lot of that liquid. So I'm going to set my blue pipette for 150 microliters, and I'm basically going to pipette off that supernatant, leaving the pellet behind. That's key here. Last time we threw away the pellet, remember, we didn't want the pellet. This time, we want to keep that pellet. So make sure that if when you come here to do this lab with us, you do not throw away your pellet at this step. Okay, so here we have a nice clear pellet this time. You can see it right there in the bottom of the tube. Uh, it's like a little white Frisbee, and that's all the silica resin, hopefully with DNA bound. Uh, and then all that liquid on top is the stuff that we don't want. So I'm basically going to use my blue pipette set for 150 microliters, and I'm going to get rid of uh, all of that supernatant. Now, I'm, I'm taking extra precautions here just to make sure that I don't actually accidentally dislodge that pellet. I'm basically ejecting the whole tip, liquid and all, leaving behind the supernate, uh, leaving behind the uh, pellet, rather, with just a little bit of liquid in there. That's okay if there's a little bit in there, no big deal. Um, and I'm going to do that for each one of my tubes. Again, we want to keep that pellet, get rid of the supernatant. So here I go, measure out that liquid and I eject the entire tip into my waste beaker. Okay, I repeat the same thing for this sample. Here's my positive control. Okay, well, there's a little bit of leftover residual in there, so I'm gonna go ahead and back, go ahead and back in there. Okay, a little bit more than I would have liked, so got rid of the rest of that, and then I do it again for the uh, cheesy corn chip sample here. Okay, now, again, because we've added the same concentration of silica resin to each tube, we have a basically the same size pellet in each one of these tubes as well. That's normal. Now, for the next step, we are going to expose our samples to a wash buffer. Now, this wash buffer contains a bunch of things, including ethanol. And so I have the wash buffer right here in this tube, and it's basically just a, a solution of chemicals, and it's designed to remove a lot of those impurities, a lot of those things that are not DNA. When we add the wash buffer, it's pretty important that it's cold, ice cold. The reason for that is because it is, uh, allows for a more thermodynamically favorable interaction between these contaminants. It essentially makes sure that they are, it kind of removes them from that silica a little bit more readily. That's why we want to make sure that it's ice cold. So I'm basically just adding 500 microliters of this to each one of my tubes. When I do this, I want the wash buffer to touch every single part of the silica. So what I'm going to do is something called pipette to mix. And so here's my tube. I take my uh, um, pi blue pipette here. Whoop. Blue pipette here is pushed down to the first stop. Okay, I go into my tube, I take up that liquid, and then I go down again to my first stop. So I go back and forth like this. This is pipetting to mix. And what I'm essentially doing here is I'm just breaking up my pellet. And so what you can see here is a nice cloudy uh, tube. That's what we want. So I'm going to repeat that process for each of my other each of my other samples as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. You guys can join me back here in a few moments. Okay, so there we go. I've added my 500 microliters of wash buffer to each of my sample tubes here, and I've broken up that pellet. And what I'm gonna do now is repeat that wash step. Again, this is a step that can be skipped. 
Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do it because it will ensure a higher purity of my product. And I want to make sure that that's the case. So what I'm going to do essentially is remove some of that wash buffer by spinning my tubes down again for um, 30 seconds. And basically I'm going to get a pellet again. I'm going to remove that wash buffer supernatants and whatever other impurities it may have removed from the silica. And I'm going to repeat the step of adding another 500 microliters of wash buffer and pipetting to mix. Okay, so essentially we're just repeating that same exact step that I just carried out. So I'm going to get my uh, 500 microliter pipette at the ready again. I'm going to get my blue pipette tips at the ready. And I'm going to, pie, I'm going to uh, grab a fresh tip here and remove that wash buffer supernatant. So basically here we go again. I have my pellet at the bottom of the tube and we're keeping the pellet again and we're going to remove that supernatant. But if I left my pipette set for 500 and I get rid of as much of that supernatant as possible, that's a good way to make sure that you're removing a lot of that wash buffer. Now for this step in particular, it's okay if there's a little bit of wash buffer left over. We're adding another 500 microliters of fresh wash buffer uh, again anyway. So it doesn't matter if there's a little bit left over. The more you get out, the better, of course, but uh, so try to get as much out as possible. And then we are going to go ahead and pipette to mix again to break up that pellet once more, just like we did before. Now, when you're doing these steps with pipetting to mix, you do not want to uh, go too vigorously here and, and essentially blow your samples out onto the workbench, because if you do that, you are losing valuable DNA. We need every little bit of DNA that we can uh, for a successful PCR to amplify that tubulin and um, 35S. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat the wash step with each of these samples. Uh, you guys can go ahead and sit back for one moment. Okay, so I've gone ahead and added the wash buffer to each of my samples once again. I pipetted to mix to make sure that they are all uh, nice and cloudy and that pellet was broken up. And I'm gonna go ahead and spin them down for another 30 seconds. So now, the difference is this time, what we're going to do is we're going to remove every last drop of supernatant. We're going to make sure that all of that wash buffer and whatever contaminants it may have removed from the silica are removed from that tube completely. Because our goal now that we have theoretically purified silica uh, bound form that has formed salt bridges with DNA, um, our goal now is to remove that DNA from the silica. We want to get a nice sample of purified DNA. So what I'm going to do is use my blue pipette set for 500 microliters, get most of that supernatant off of the uh, pellet, but I'm going to make sure that I get every last drop. And to do that accurately without disturbing the pellet, uh, I'm going to use my yellow pipette to get the remaining uh, liquid out. So basically, I took out 500 microliters, and then I have my yellow pipette set for, you know, it could be like 50 to 60 to 70 microliters, and I'm going to use that to remove the last ounces of liquid that are in there. So now there's essentially nothing left. Actually, there was a little bit left over in there. I'm going to make sure that I uh, get out all of that liquid. And there we have it. We have a theoretically a nice dry pellet, no liquid whatsoever. There's just a white little uh, Frisbee at the bottom of that tube. Um, and so what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to elute the DNA off of the silica by adding distilled water. And I have a tube of distilled water right here. Now I'm going to add 100 microliters of distilled water to each one of my dry pellets. So remember, I've got rid of the wash buffer and the contaminants, and I'm adding my 100 microliters of distilled water. What I'm going to do is pipette to mix, and you'll find that at this point, the pellet breaks up very nicely. And there we have it. We have a nice milky solution. That's what we want. 
And I'm going to go ahead and repeat that for each one of my samples. So I'll join you in one second. Okay, so I went ahead and I added 100 microliters of distilled water to each one of my samples. So I have all four of my samples that have this nice milky white appearance um, and hopefully contain that silica and uh, DNA that are, is now eluding off into solution. So that, again, the purpose of that distilled water is to remove uh, the DNA from the silica. And what we're going to do to help it along a little bit is we're going to place it into the heat bath for about five minutes or so at 57 degrees, and that'll help to uh, overcome those salt bridges that the DNA formed with the silica resin and remove it into solution. So we'll be back in just a few moments. Okay, so our samples are finishing up in the 57 degree uh, incubation in the heat bath over here. And so what we need to do now is get our purified DNA out of our tubes. And so if you think about it, uh, as I remove these samples from the heat bath here, we have theoretically a uh, mixture still of that silica resin and our uh, DNA essentially floating around in solution. So what we need to do is separate the DNA from the silica resin. And what I'm going to do is spin it down uh, last time here in our centrifuge for 30 seconds. And so what this is going to do is uh, this is going to remove that silica resin from the um, DNA that's now floating around in that distilled water. So um, hopefully that's what we achieved by putting it in the heat bath here again for 57 degrees Celsius. When we remove our DNA from the tube, we want to make sure that we don't get any silica resin at all. And as it turns out, if we get even a little tiny bead of silica resin into our uh, mixture, what winds up happening is that can interfere with the amplification step that we are uh, going to undergo next. And so uh, when I pipette at this step, I am basically going to pipette from the supernatant by itself. No pellet at all. We don't want the pellet this time, okay? So remember, we're trying to keep the supernatant. And remember, you've been uh, this whole time theoretically throwing away your supernatant with that wash buffer step again and again and again. It's easy to get into the habit of just throwing your supernatant away, but that is not what you want to do. We're going to pipette 50 microliters using our yellow pipette um, directly into a fresh tube. And so I've actually gone ahead and labeled a bunch of fresh tubes right over here. So I have the minus, the plus, and the uh, organic and cheesy corn chip tubes all labeled separately here. So I'm going to get a yellow pipette tip. I'm going to pipette out 50 microliters of supernatant. Again, going nowhere near that pellet. So this is my C-tube. This is my uh, organic corn chip. So I'm going to go to my C-tube over here, and I'm going to go right down to the bottom and pipette out um, my 50 microliters of supernatant. And what we have here is purified DNA. So congratulations, that very long process, that seemingly long process, all was to get this, a, a tube of purified DNA. Now that's like a stock tube. We can basically use that to undergo a series of different reactions. And so what we're going to do next is um, we're going to amplify uh, both 35S and tubulin genes, or gene regions, I should say, um, using PCR. And so that's where this DNA comes in handy. So the process of PCR is a very important one in biochemistry. It's um, used every single day in molecular biology labs throughout the world. And so when you are uh, undergoing PCR, when you come to the, the learning center here, uh, just understand that we use PCR in a number of our labs. And it's all basically the same process. We just amplify different gene regions. So I'm not going to go through the details of PCR here today, just because uh, you guys can check out another video for that. Um, I am simply going to show you how we set up the PCR for our uh, particular reactions here. Okay, so again, I have all of my stock tubes of uh, DNA here. All of those pellet tubes with the silica resin are in the garbage now, so we are done with the DNA extraction. So our next step then is to set up our PCRs. We have to set up two reactions for each one of the snack tubes that we uh, extract the DNA from. 
So we need a 35S tube. That's our test tube looking for the genetic modification. Remember, if we see this 35S region present, then we, we know that some genetic modification must have, gone, must have taken place. We are also going to set up a separate tube for tubulin, and this is our control. So all of our plant material should have this. So GM or not GM should have that tubulin control. And we are going to use two microliters of DNA for each one of these reactions. All of your reactions set up for you right here. And so I've got a little stri uh, strip of tubes here. And what I did was I combined, um, so this is actually a strip tube that contained bead mix. And so beads are basically these little dehydrated uh, balls of uh, reagents, essentially, that contain everything that you need to set up a PCR, except for template DNA. Okay, so PCR works by amplifying DNA, a specific target region of DNA. And so uh, those bead mixes have nucleotides, the building materials for new sequence, for new uh, stretches of DNA. They have primer, they have, um, I'm sorry, not primer, they have uh, DNA polymerase, or specifically TAC polymerase. That's the construction crew that's going to help to assemble new pieces of DNA. And they have the mixings for a buffer solution to keep all of these reagents uh, interacting uh, peacefully and um, balanced. And so what we add, or what I added, I should say, was primer. And so if you notice on this little strip of tubes here, I have eight tubes. Half of the tubes have a black hinge on the top of them over here. The other half of the tubes have a little clear hinge on them. The clear hinge tubes over here are for tubulin. That's our control. The black hinge tubes over here are for 35S. So we need to set up two separate reactions for each snack, as I just said. So what I'm going to do is open up each one of these tubes. And I'm going to add two microliters of DNA to each one of these reactions. Okay, so I have one tube for the positive control. I have one tube for the negative control, one tube for the um, uh, cheesy corn chip, and one for the organic corn chip. And then I have a tubulin and a 35S treatment separately. So we need to be careful when we're adding our reagents here. We don't want to add, um, we want to make sure that we're switching our tips every single time. And the other thing I wanted to point out is for this part of the experiment, it's very easy for students to simply not add uh, any reagents, any DNA to their, their PCR mix. So if you notice, this is two microliters of, of DNA right here. So right here, that's all you've got. <laughs> it doesn't look like much. And if you haven't done this very often, it's very easy to simply think you're adding DNA to these tubes, but you're adding nothing at all. So I'm going to go ahead to my, I just uh, pulled from the positive control DNA tube. So I'm going to inject my two microliters of DNA into my tubulin treatment. I'm going to close that up just to make sure that I don't uh, mistakenly add anything else to that tube. I'm going to get a fresh pipette tip. I'm going to go back into my tube of purified positive control DNA and pull another two microliters. Then I'm going to go to my 35S treatment over here and inject that two microliters of DNA into that tube. I'm going to close it up. Then I'm going to repeat the process for the other, re for the other samples as well. So here I have my negative control, two microliters of DNA into the mix for tubulin, then another two microliters of DNA into the mix for 35S. Switch my tips. Again, closing my uh, tops just to make sure I don't mix them up. And then I'm going to do the same for my cheesy, for my uh, organic corn chip, rather. By the way, I did pre-label each of these tubes. If you're wondering uh, what I'm doing here, I'm not like adding them to random tubes. I actually already pre-labeled them with C's and D's uh, just so I know who is who. So uh, the important thing here is that we get one treatment for each. And then here's my cheesy corn chip. And we're done. And so each one of these little baby tubes, which notice that they're significantly smaller than the microfuge tubes, these are known as PCR tubes. They're actually designed to fit into a uh, machine called the thermocycler right over here. And so this unit is also known as a PCR machine. 
And so if you notice, if I open it up, uh, I have these little, a little silver plate in here and there are holes in there that specifically will fit these PCR tubes. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna give these a little flick for good measure and make sure all the liquid down at the bottom of the tube and away we go. And I can go ahead and uh, throw our little uh, strip of tubes here into the thermal cycler. Again, they're fitting into those holes precisely. And one program in the thermal cycler here will uh, amplify both tubulin and 35S. And so this is essentially a glorified hot plate that will heat up and cool down in programmable ways. And our uh, GMO test program is actually already saved in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and push that GMO program and run. And in about an hour and 15 minutes, we will have hopefully amplified tubulin and 35S. And so the, what we're going to do, essentially, remember, is we are trying to see whether or not those snack foods, the cheesy corn chip and the organic corn chip, have genetic modification or show evidence of genetic modification. So we extracted our DNA successful. So here we go. I have my extracted DNA here. And we pulled from those tubes to set up our PCR, our reactions that will amplify specifically 35S or tubulin. Okay, so I used specific primers, tubulin and 35S, to set up those reactions. And so theoretically, what's going to happen now uh, over the course of the next hour or so is uh, those regions within those samples will be amplified uh, many, many times to the point where there'll be over a billion copies of either tubulin or 35S, depending on the tube. That's pretty crazy. So next time what we're going to do is we are going to uh, take a look at the results and actually visualize our PCR products using a technique known as gel electrophoresis. And so during gel electrophoresis, uh, that allows us to separate out our samples on the basis of size. And so that'll tell us what kind of amplification we have going on in each of the different tubes. We're also going to predict the size of our 35S um, amplicons, which are the amplified fragments that come out of our PCR reactions, and our tubulin fragments using uh, some bioinformatics. Okay, so that's, that's our plan for next time. So stay tuned, and I will see you in part two of GMO. And uh, uh, I hope to see you there. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for watching.